My book, Clinical Dharma, has a lot behind it in that it kind of takes together uh, lessons learned, let's say, over the last really like 30 years, almost 30 years. You know, it really starts with my um, stopping using drugs and alcohol and getting plugged into this uh, idea that it was a good thing to be of service to people. And I really got into that. And I also got into, I'd never really been into anything particularly spiritual, at least since my bar mitzvah. Um, I enjoyed my bar mitzvah, I liked that, all that, but then I sort of walked away from any of those kind of matters uh, for a long time. So when I got into that service side and so the spirituality side, and then I was brought to a retreat that was at a Zen Buddhist monastery. Um, I had like four months sober and I got my first meditation lesson and I've never stopped sitting since then. So uh, very quickly, you know, this is the early 90s and so even, you know, secular mindfulness hasn't really developed and people aren't really talking about it as much uh, outside the Buddhist community. And I got a job as a high school English teacher and I just started teaching my students to meditate. And so ever since then, in all kinds of different scenarios, I've gone ahead and I've taught it uh, to people. And then, uh, so that's the Dharma part. The Dharma part is that I've been practicing some form of Buddhist meditation for like 28 years. And then the clinical part is, you know, I was an educator for years you know, starting with that high school English teacher, and then I was a diversity educator, social justice ed educator. And I noticed, well, I didn't notice, I had like a flame out, you know, forget about burnout. I just, you know, I went down in flames from not being able to take care of myself, not, not being able to have a balance in my life with all that. Then when I moved out here to Los Angeles in 2002, I made the transition to becoming a therapist and, you know, Ever since then, I've sort of noticed how easy it is to, um, in the service of trying to help, to really just take yourself down. And so, um, Four Noble Truths in the Eightfold Path of the Buddha, you know, the Buddha Dharma, has basically brought me through, to and through, just about anything and everything that I've been through in my life. So I thought, well, what about plugging, just sort of, presenting it to people in the helping professions as a self-care program, as it were. And it's also because there's been this, you know, this constant conversation going on about um, so-called secular mindfulness, where the ethical factors of the Eightfold Path are kind of extracted a little bit. You know, they're not there, it's more like skills training. And so my goal was to put the, those ethical factors back in and to look at it holistically and say, Let's, uh, you know, Buddha presented essentially like a complete psychology that you could work with to end suffering. And that's what he said. He, he said he taught two things, suffering and the end of suffering. So why not follow that bouncing ball? And then I, my uh, motivation was, uh, had a lot to do with just watching my colleagues burn out and watching how you know, people who have the best of intentions and the best skills even, and even sometimes really pretty decent self-care abilities, just there's one thing missing, it seemed to me. So, so I'm not saying it's the be all and the end all, but that's my offering. Like that's been my experience over these years is that if I turn towards a mindfulness meditation that has a basis in ethical living, and a basis in the development of wisdom and, and building our, my intentions off of that wisdom, uh, that that was the way to go. And then there were, I had a few people before me. I think of uh, the psychiatrist, Mark Epstein, who's written a few books and, you know, uh, Psychotherapy Without a Self or Without the Self. Um, a couple other books where he was a Buddhist before he was a psychiatrist. And so I was sort of moved by that too, looking at how, um, uh, I've been taught as an EMDR therapist, you know, eye movement desensitization reprocessing, a therapy developed by Francine Shapiro. And Francine Shapiro talks about we are able to um, allow the client's brain or the client's psyche or the client's spirit to heal itself. We're not doing anything but facilitating a process. I'm not, I'm not doing surgery. 
I'm just like, here's this process, here's this path, and I help them down that path, and they heal themselves. So that's the other, that, that, that's where it all came together for me, where it's, that's very Buddhist, or it, that seems very Dharma to me, is, you know, Buddha said that each of us has to have our own direct experience, that he could only sort of describe what he did, and that we can have that opportunity to have that experience, and that I have to have it directly. So clinical Dharma is a lot about how a clinician or a helper of any kind because you know, in the end, you know, on the back jacket of the book, I, I was like, you know, yoga teachers, this, that, the other, and I, I ended with podcasters because we were talking about podcasting before. But um, but you know that anyone in a helping position, whether uh, they chose it because they, it's like I want to be a therapist or I want to be a, a doctor, um, or you know, so many of us, I mean, you know, it's the reality of life that at some point or another, whether it happens a lot or a little we're put in that position where someone needs our help. So what does that look like? You know, how do you best provide that? So that was the motivation for the book and I'm hoping that, you know, I've gotten some decent feedback in terms of people saying, oh yeah, that makes sense. I'm gonna try and look at it that way and maybe I feel like the help will be better and then the helper will have a sustainable life. They'll be able to keep helping. So that's kind of the ins and the outs of the book. That's the rub right there of, you know, what happens to those people who are in a position of leadership or trying to start um, something either from the ground up or even if they come in and they're sort of uh, getting into a situation where they're either replacing or augmenting a team is that um, I think there's such a, especially like in this society, where um, A-type personalities are rewarded for their atypicalness, um, that this idea of allowing or this idea of facilitating a process, I you know I like to think of um, you know who I think of is the uh, I forget his name I'm sorry but the CEO of JetBlue, who is very uh, famous for his uh, his adult ADD diagnosis. Like he's out about it and it's bad and he is the CEO of JetBlue. And the story goes that, you know, um, Ned Hallowell, who wrote a couple of the major books on ADD, uh, he's a Harvard psychiatrist and he wrote a book called um, Driven to Distraction, which was about uh, childhood ADD, ADHD. And then uh, Delivered from Distraction was about adult ADD. And so he had a, more than one story. I think he used the CEO of JetBlue as a, an example. And he said that the two keys to being able to live with ADD, I know this is a slightly separate subject, but it's not at the same time, right? Is that um, one must have the right partner and the right job, right? So either it has to be a fellow ADD who doesn't mind, <laughs> sort of like squirrel, um, and or it has to be uh, someone who complements or kind of sort of balances that sort of thing. And then also there's the sort of depathologizing of it, you know, that hopefully would happen within the relationship and which throughout the book, of course, you know, he, he does the same. Um, but anyway, so, so then there's the right job. And what is the right job? The right job is uh, an ADD person, um, according to Hallowell, uh, is, you know, can't focus on things that are boring. The ADD person is hyper-focused on those things that are awesome and exciting. So finding something that is meaningful and that really works for the person, and then the willingness and the ability to delegate like crazy. Right, and that's the, where the success is. So, in a sense, like if if you're talking about, like you know, so I help run a healthcare business. So there's there's a couple of things going on. One is we need to be attending to the clinical aspect, and that's most of what I'm in charge of. But you know, we're also having to look at how to manage teams and how to bring people together and how to keep the the business flowing. And the way that gets done is by having the right team members in the right places and the leaders are able to bring out that which is you know, uh, amazing in those people. And if I'm not doing that, if I'm trying to micromanage you know, everyone and trying to put people in boxes 
that match my vision, you know, which is not necessarily a, a vision, it's a control problem, um, then I'm just going to end up with, in my estimation, the business is going to flounder um, and, and I'm going to flounder because um, there's a number of, there's a number of uh, different spiritual literature places where you can read this, but this idea of, um, you know, I can't control everything. I can't control other people uh, in the way that I would like to. So I think, you know, that's where the burnout occurs. So I think, you know, even in a, in a business venture, you know, one uh, would be wise to step back um, and allow those people that have, they've surrounded themselves with to do their thing. And my, my role, and the role that I have right now at, at Refuge Recovery is really mostly about visioning and supervising clinicians. And so the more that I vision, supervise clinicians, and then have everybody do their thing, I feel, you know, I go home at the end of the day and I'm not, you know, wishing I had a completely different career. <laughs> I I'm, I'm feel like I did something. Um, but mostly what I've tried to do is facilitate a process. So not everyone probably possibly has the same outlook, but maybe that's 20 years of, 28 years of Buddhist meditation. <laughs> yeah, that's my... Uh, that's my view. That's maybe the skew that I have, but it feels like kind of like a healthy one. So, a leader keeps people safe by having good boundaries. You know, um, it's a it's a, a word that people uh, get annoyed by. I find you know, you know, it's like been whatever 20, 30 years, forty years maybe of boundaries. And you know what? They're at the bottom line, right? So, but what are boundaries? Boundaries are flexible. Boundaries are have some porousness to them. You know, they're not uh, walls. They're not moats with alligators. You know, so um, I think that uh, safety is created by leaders through um, clear policies, clear positions clear mission statements, clear, uh, clear cl clarity and transparency in the relationship that is not about, you know, it's like I'm your buddy, you know? I mean, it's, it's a different type of friendship. And, you know, I'm, in, I'm in, in clinical work, so it's even more so. You know, like clinical boundaries are extremely important. And I have seen more than one uh, clinical business go awry because of a lack of boundaries because it, it, it's we're dealing with human beings and emotions and and um, relationships essentially so if one is not keeping those boundaries then we're not keeping the clients safe so that's it's almost like the extreme sports version of of your question you know it's um, that uh, the boundaries have to be very clear and the, the thing is, is that in those situations when you're dealing, especially with clients, sometimes with staff, there's, there's going to be pushback on that. And so then the, the key is then I have, to, I have to hold that boundary and know that it's for the good of everybody. Um, the other thing that I um, talk about a lot in groups that I run and workshops is boundaries with the boundaryless. You know, some people just won't follow the direction like some people don't like boundaries you know and and the reason they don't like it is because they don't want to see change they don't want to be limited they don't want to they don't want to lose the familiarity of whatever you know they, people don't like them um, and so the truth about boundaries that's the the extreme version of it the truth about boundaries is that they have to be set and reset and reset and reset and that there is where some of the safety is created is through the acknowledgement that this is not a one-stop shop and I've set these boundaries and now we're all going to just move forward. This is going back to the Four Noble Truths Eightfold Path aspect. So the first two factors of the Eightfold Path are wisdom and intention. So I'm constant or you know, right understanding and setting wise intention. So what's, what's the wisdom we're talking about? The wisdom of what is a good leader and what are the different 
aspects of leadership? What are the different aspects of how I'm going to be most helpful to those that work with me and all those we work for? And then once I've gathered that wisdom together, and of course it's not like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you know, it's all working at the same time, but once I build that wisdom, then it's then I can set my intention. Now, I I'm setting an intention right now, right? I set the intention for the next word I'm gonna say. Like every single thing we say and do has an intention behind it, thought preceding action. So I if I am able to get into that flow, the, the sort of impermanence of of moment to moment and, and, and what that looks like, then I'm setting and resetting intention. I'm setting and resetting boundaries. And some, you know, we're talking in small increments and in larger increments. You know, there's the resetting of the intention of what I'm going to say next. And there's the resetting of the intention of what our five year plan is for, you know, for our business or for what we're doing. So, um, so that's my, my vision of boundaries is very, it's not like that it's so much more flexible or, you know, like lovey-dovey. As a matter of fact, a lot in clinical dharma, I talk a lot about how, you know, uh, compassion, compassionate care, or compassionate leadership looks different to each person and for each person. There's um, the bodhisattva of compassion. So bodhisattva is a being who uh, goes to nirvana and says, I'm not going to hang out in nirvana. I'm going to go back and be born into a human body again, and I'm going to help more people. Okay. So there's the bodhisattva of compassion. And um, when it's the bodhisattva of compassion is represented, like by statues or in paintings, it often has a lot of arms and a lot of eyes. Because I need a lot of different ways of seeing, to, to, because what's compassionate for you is poison for you. And then I have to have a lot of different solutions, right? And I think across the board, A type or the type I'm describing, that's a leadership deal is, you know, like I, there's, I have to be able to be there for all the different people and all the different situations and all the, the diversity of, of experience. So, um, so that's my kid. And, I need dozens of arms and dozens of eyes, right? Just for that one person. So, um, so in the end, that's that's kind of the the role of boundaries in the whole deal. So I have a couple of stories of endings and rebirths and and then endings and endings. <laughs> um, so, uh, refuge recovery center where I am the clinical director, uh, we started up, uh, myself and Noah Levine, we started it up within another uh, organization and we had different partners, we had some partners. And it wasn't the right fit. You know, there's nothing to say ill will, any direction, just wasn't the right fit. And that was, even though uh, there was a phoenix from the ashes from it, that was very painful. Like, and, you know, um, whether or not to feel one's feelings, you know, you're asking a therapist whether people should, but, you know, and at the same time, um, I didn't want to feel all that stuff. You know, I had, I had a little bit of, you know, the five, it's more the five aspects of grieving nowadays, you know, for a long time, it was five phases, but they're not taken in order in that way for the most part. It's like ping pong and it's all over the place. But, you know, I definitely had some denial you know, that it was happening or, or that um, I couldn't fix it. Uh, I was, there was some bargaining, you know, like, well, if I just, you know, pretzel myself a little bit like this, we can work this out and it'll work out. Um, there was anger. Um, there was definitely sadness. And um, at points it felt more like depression than just sad. And then acceptance. Right. And so, and, and I didn't go to acceptance and then stay there. You know, like I went to acceptance and I was like sad again. I was angry again. I did a little bit of denial. So, and, and so allowing myself to just have all that and to have, you know, so I'm someone who has found myself um, at the head of a lot of different things in my life, you know, regardless whether it's a business or a clinic or a band or, you know, whatever, whatever it was. And so I've always had my team, 
right? Because you know, when, if you're in a leadership position, oftentimes you're kind of alone. It's lonely at the top kind of a deal. And I've always had a team like back in New York, I had, I had my, I called them my trilateral commission. I had a Zen monk, my therapist, and my uh, sponsor in a 12-step program. And you know, I could go to one of those three or two of those three or all of those three about anything and everything in my life. So I had the equivalent here in Los Angeles and I went through it and actually where I came to was I'm out, I'm done. I, I, it, it was a little bit of I'm beaten, but it was also a little bit of just I'm, I'm, I'm done, I'm ready to see what's next. And then Noah, being Noah, um, was like, hey, you know, we're going to run the outpatient center out of the meditation center for a while. You know, you want to be clinical? And I was like, no, I don't. <laughs> and I said, I'll see a few clients for you, but I don't want to do that. And he's like, oh, okay, uh, you know, we'll go ahead and do that. We'll see how long that lasts. And anyway, eventually, of course, it's the way things work with Noah. I just ended up clinical director. You know, it's very, he's got a great smile. So, um, so anyway, so I, went into that with him and now we're doing it exactly the way we wanted to do it, right? So, so there is something to be said for fully going through, you know, the, the pain and the difficulty that comes with the ending because again, from a Buddhist perspective and other perspectives, you know, an ending is just a beginning with ashes attached to it. You know, it's just sort of like, all right, so what, you know, it, everything's impermanent anyway. So, that's not a reason to just like throw everything away and stop living. It's a reason, to, you know, it means that I have to, you know, well, what's next? You know, and I thought what was next was anything but running a rehab. And then Noah was like, ah, oh, come on. And, and then I realized, I was like, oh yeah, this was our vision. Our vision was Buddhist rehab, right? What we had done was we partnered up and it was like Buddhist rehab within a bigger structure. So now I don't do anything but what I want to be doing and what I'm good at doing and what I feel is most helpful anyway. And then the other part of it was is that my other, the other part of my, or the big part of my clinical life was having become an EMDR therapist a long time ago. And then almost simultaneously with my working with uh, Noah to resurrect refuge, I thought, oh, I'm going to get in contact with my old friend, Jamie Marich, who is a very, you know, like an entrepreneur. She's a machine. Um, in terms, she writes books, creates programs, just all this stuff. And she was kind of doing a similar thing, EMDR and mindfulness. So uh, I went to her and was much more fully formed in, in terms of that. And I said, you have an institute now. Would, would you like West Coast faculty? And she's like, oh, I was hoping that you were thinking that. And so then that brought me to a place of um, sort of entrepreneurial action as an affiliate of you know, her and working with her to you know, deepen this whole thing. And then before you know it, it's like, oh, we better write a book about this. So, so here I am and then I'm writing, we're writing a book together and then I'm coming back to Noah and one of my original ideas, I said, you know, how about mindfulness is obvious, Buddhist mindfulness is what we're doing here. How about EMDR therapy is the primary clinical thing that we do? And again, this was another thing that's a blessing of working with Noah. He's like, sure, I don't, you know, go, do, I trust you. And so now I'm basically doing everything I've been trained to do, everything that excites me, everything that I think helps to end suffering, you know, all of this. And this is just in the, this is, I think, in less than two years, I just described. And, and the book, the second book, is coming out in August. And it's already, we've gotten you know, some endorsements from people who are like, oh my God, Bruce Springsteen just endorsed my, my record kind of stuff. So, um, so there it is, right? Like feel my feelings from the ending and um, go through that process and then allow for whatever the next process is. And I'm not saying that every time it looks as good as what I just described, but it's definitely worthwhile to, you know, to not give up. The other story of uh, startup land that I've been in, actually I think there's probably a couple more, but the real sort of, uh, uh, the one that, um, you know, broke my heart. Um, but, and I still don't know how it ends though. Maybe that's what it is. I, 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 it ended, but I don't know how it ends. Is I, I got hooked up with some folks who wanted to do a wearable. Um, for uh, 
for therapeutic purposes, kind of like a Fitbit. For the, there, there's a there's one out there now that's I, I don't know if it's a wearable, um, but it's like it's like a Fitbit for my emotions. Anyway, we were working on this project, and I was working with some amazing people, like you know former CEO of major company and people at Idea Lab. You know, this, um, one of the older um, uh, oh I forget the word. Um, sorry, uh, but uh, where startups go to start up. Um, anyway, <laughs> it'll come back to me someday. Anyway, so uh, working with all these people and and then it was sort of the wearable, like as soon as the Apple Watch came out, as soon as the watch came out, the wearable market kind of tanked, right? I, that's the way I understand it because I haven't been following it as much, but like Fitbit's prices went, you know, like the stock went way down, et cetera, et cetera. And, every, and everybody was trying to do it. So then what we were doing, we, we, we pivoted and we were like, okay, we're going to just do the app part of it. And you know, apps are there's ubiquitous. It's like there's a gajillion of them, and we had a good thing. And we actually went out and, and we were doing this. We were asking for, um, we were doing an ask, and nobody was putting down the money. And it just seemed really odd to, to all of us, especially the the CEO, why it wasn't working, because we had really good tech people and really good you know clinical people. And it was really solid. Um, and we also knew that there was, you know, there were some competing projects out there, as there often are, you know, the competition. And I don't know. We, I, we tried to resurrect it like three, four times. And it, you know, it doesn't exist. You know, the company doesn't exist anymore. And so, so that one, that one threw me for a loop, and I think it was it was pretty much around the time that the that clinic that I was at before Refuge blew up. So like everything was blowing up, everything went kaplooey kind of all at once. And I did do a little bit of a controlling sort of a thing, like I'll I'll I'll, I'll fold in. So past life, I've had many past lives, and not like I was Catherine the Great, nothing like that. But you know, I had this past life where I. I went to NYU film school for a bit and I wrote the screenplay and I gave it to my friend who was playing tennis with an agent. The agent was like, oh my God, this is great. You know, like, like the first person I gave it to, like completely not, not the usual story. And I'm like, and I got this meeting with, you know, one of the biggest agencies at the time. This is in the early 90s. And I go there and I get the royal treatment. And then the way that that agency worked, it was kind of small is they would have a weekly meeting and there'd be one script that they'd be talking about for that week. So they only looked at like 52 things a year, essentially. And I was the script of the week and they said no. And it, a lot of it had to do, my agent was the, more the theater person in New York and they were on the phone with everyone in Beverly Hills and they were like, Beverly Hills, we're like, oh, we're not. And she couldn't defend me properly. I know, right? And so, Anyway, the moral story is that she really believed in it, but she, she said, if the team doesn't go for it, it's, not gonna, it's just not going to go anywhere. But both of us were like, but we're going to barrel through. And so she just kept on trying to give it to like smaller producers, things like that. And it went on for like a year, a year and a half, and it never got sold to anybody. And everyone's response was, well, you know, why didn't the agency take it? We know who you are, the agent. And we know how you work, and so what's wrong with this thing? And anyway, I mean, I don't know if it's a, if it, it could have worked out. I suppose it was something that could have, would have, should have been done the way it was done. In other words, I tried, and I got to have my script read by like really cool people, um, and not made. But you know, that's the story. So, yeah, I have uh, in the entertainment world, in my entertainment career, I've got uh, endless like um, uh, disappointments. You know, I've had I've had some successes, but I had like really significant disappointments, like on the cusp of. You know, I've got a couple of friends. Was like one friend, Dave Smith. He's a Buddhist teacher, a fellow Buddhist teacher, and he's like, "Oh man, you yeah, you oh man, are you okay?" <laughs> like he said, "Yeah, your stories are awful." So, so yeah, it's all. It, it really is all about you know just. It's not brushing yourself off and pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. It's like just experiencing the whole messy, messiness of it and then seeing what's next. 
I don't know if this is going to be the answer for everybody to that dilemma of like I don't want to I don't want to have a day job or I don't want to give up the dream or what does giving up the dream really look like? So when I I got sober and then I was gainfully unemployed. Actually, the, the way that I got sober was the band that I was in. That was, it was the band that got the furthest, you know, Japan and all over Europe. And our second record was about to come out. And then the band broke up. The lead singer kind of just said, I'm out of here and disappeared into the woods. And the record company was like, where's your lead singer? And we're like, I don't know. <laughs> and so anyway, uh, so they're like, all right, we're not going to put out the record because you can't tour behind it without a singer. So. Um, anyway, that was the end of my uh, drinking and using was I just like went right down the tubes. And when I started my sobriety, I couldn't get out of bed. I just, you know, like the way I stayed sober mostly was like crawling to 12-step meetings and like spending the rest of the time, you know, staring at my navel and not going outside because outside had stuff that might hurt me. And I even got a couple of phone calls from people who were like, hey, you want to play on my record or join my band? And I was like, no, oh, I, couldn't, I couldn't do anything. And, but I did take care of myself. I did do what I needed to do to get healthy because I was unhealthy, you know, in addition to being disappointed, I was very unhealthy. So I got my health back and then I went through a process of, I actually did like career counseling um, from the perspective of having this, um, you know, sort of the, the disability of alcoholism and drug addiction. So I went through that and that's how I ended up becoming a high school English teacher. And through, but the process was is the first question that actually this is this is a good one is the the first question that they asked in this career counseling was name five careers that you would say are the five careers you would most love to have and forget that you're a whatever age you are whatever gender you are whatever millennium this is like if Queen Elizabeth if that's the gig that you would dream of then write it down. So when it started at like the level of pure just fantasy, theoretically. And so I, I still remember what I wrote down. I wrote down center fielder for the Yankees, wasn't gonna happen. Um, center for the Knicks, even funnier, the height challenges are very important. Um, rock star, I kept that just generic, just rock star. Um, then I used slashes to get a couple extra in, and it was like novelist filmmaker. And then the last one was civil rights worker in the 60s. So that was my list. And eventually, so I went, I became a high school English teacher um, because I actually told them, I said, please don't make me have like a creative job. Like that's where I was at the time. I was like, I don't want to, I just, I don't want the heartbreak anymore. And I want some structure, but I want to be doing something meaningful. And that's high school English teacher seemed to cover it. So. Became a high school English teacher, and one year into my teaching, there were riots, race riots in the neighborhood where I was teaching. So I end up sort of on the fly, start teaching what I know about the civil rights era to my students, and then they're like, oh, there's this teacher down the hall, and they're doing the same thing. And they pulled me into their office, and they're like, do you want to help? I'm like, yeah, I guess so. And I ended up on this journey where I basically was sort of educating people about those issues for the next 15 years, right? So again, you know, I, I'm not like, I'm not one of those, I'm not, you know, into the secret, let's say, you know, the, the law of attraction in, in that way, but I am into the idea of abundance I know that's almost the same thing, but it, that that my getting something doesn't take away from you, that the, and that and that if I give, it, it will come back to me, whatever that's going to look like. So and then you know, like I I did that for uh, taught in that school for three years, and then I went on a soul searching trip, and I was like, you know what, I'm I, at the time I was turning thirty, and I'm like, all right, I'm going to give the art life one more chance. And then I go back and I end up, you know, writing for magazines, playing in a band, the band gets signed. You know, I end up touring in a bus instead of a van, you know, like, and being creative and having, I don't think I would have gotten there without that. Some people would call it a detour, but I call it, you know, a, you know my particular path. 
So especially like young entrepreneurs and like in, in the way it is now, I remember back, you know, it was really, you know, like I can't remember what year Justin Bieber arrives, but he was like, you know, 13 years old or whatever it was. It used to be, we used to, you know, back in my day, you know, you'd be, you know, like 24, let's say, and you'd be like, oh, I'm over the hill. You know, now kids are like, you know, in entertainment, they're like 15 and they're like, oh man, I'm too old, right? And then that bleeds into this world, you know, sort of, you know, Silicon Valley startup, you know, all of it, like people very young hitting heights, very young. And so I think a lot of it has to do, and I saw, I, I saw it in, around me in the punk rock scene, you know, when I was, I was 16 years old when I started playing CBGBs and I was surrounded by some people my age and some people a little older. And we all, we were, I, I don't know, I'll speak for myself. I was a little bit emotionally immature and not ready to take care of myself in that. And I didn't become like uber famous. Some of the people around me did, and it didn't have a good effect on them or if, if they weren't ready for it. So I think it's the same in the startup world. It's kind of like do whatever you can to stay in some kind of, for, and I'm not, I'll just use this term because I can't think of another, some kind of spiritual, um, I'm not gonna say belief because that's not what it is. Just like acknowledge that it's that uh, we're a, a um, spiritual being living in a human body kind of a deal. And that, you know, the success is just a, um, it's a gift that you got and that you then gave. And if it's not necessary anymore, or if it's just so big that you don't have to do anything anymore, and but then you, you kind of implode because what's the meaning of life? You know, I conquered the world with my thing. Um, yeah, just, no, whether you're that person or the person who hasn't been able to get anything started up or doesn't even have that idea. You know, you both have, everyone has the opportunity somehow to find, you know, the, the capital T truth inside and inside the, everything that we're talking about. You know, sort of like, uh, you know, it's like, a, it's like a show, you know? It's like we're all, we're all in this, uh, play and behind the play is the meaning and each of us has that inside um, so yeah it's seeing it's seeing oneself on a path instead of heading towards rocketing towards this destination you know, it's like when people get into I guess the last way I can put it is another Buddhist formulation is you know the three poisons greed hatred and delusion Right. So, you know, greed is not all about like money, money, money or Wall Street level greed or, you know, startup, you know, gets a gajillion dollars in a, in a, in a, um, on the market. It's, um, it's the little things like, you know, right now I'm starting to think about ice cream. Right. And, but if I take it a little further, it's like ice, you know, ice cream. Um, hatred is, you know, it's also the other um, translations are aversion or, you know, anger, right? So um, if I live, you know, I'm, I'm averse to not being famous or I'm uh, averse to uh, this new world that I've created either through my success or my failure, that's what's killing me, not the success or the failure. And the delusion is that any of this is going to make me happy in the first place. So it's this endless sort of, you know, that's the second truth of the uh, Four Noble Truths is the cause of all our suffering is craving, clinging, and aversion and unhealthy attachment. So if that's how I'm rolling, you know, whether I'm making $28 million overnight or whether I'm, you know, uh, a YouTube sensation or whether, you know, whatever it is, the delusion is, is that that's happiness and it's not. It's the results of craving and clinging. And again, this is not like judgmental. It's not a moral judgment. It's just the truth, or at least that's the way Buddha understood it. And that's kind of how I kind of understand it. And so the answer to the suffering ending is not by getting more money or starting another startup or, 
or you know, it's from ending craving and clinging. How do you do that? Buddha said Eightfold Path. A lot of that was meditation, but it was also speaking right, acting right, and having right livelihood. One of the eight factors of the Eightfold Path is right livelihood, wise livelihood. So that's another way of framing it. You know? Am I being helpful or harmful with what I'm doing? I don't want to sound like the guy, you know, get off my lawn back in my time, blah, blah, blah. But you know what? These days, it's a lot harder to be successful or it's a lot harder to live with success. Not to say that some of these problems didn't exist before, but the whole culture of, first of all, that everybody gets their 15 minutes, like for real. And usually it's longer than 15 minutes. And a lot of times it's for completely ridiculous <laughs> reasons. Um, and um, so, you know, people get success and then there's so many more eyeballs on them and so many more pressures put on them to be a certain way or act a certain way. And then there's the, you know, there was in the past, there was this loss of privacy. And now there's a loss of privacy. And in the past you could get, let's say if it was entertainment or even business, you know, you could get a bad review in the LA Times. And now it's like anybody can log on to their computer and just spew hatred. So there's that aspect where there's like this extra special sauce added to you put yourself in the public eye and you are absolutely going to get haters, period. And could be lots of them and it could be like with the worst verbiage and just nastiness. So. So that's one of the pitfalls that was there before, but it's like worse now. So it really has become a be careful what you wish for, because if, if you're not ready for it, like the way I remember, I don't know if I've made this up in my head after years and years and years, but I had heard that Paul Newman never read his reviews. He didn't care. It, you know, it wasn't going to help him become a better act. You know, he, and he knew that some of them would be bad and he just didn't care to read them. And supposedly he was like quite happy, you know, and him and Joanne Woodward, they, they didn't go to a lot of parties or, you know, like they didn't do that whole social scene. Anyway, point being that, you know, it's harder to kind of live below the radar than it used to be, if, even if you chose, you know, if you're successful. Then there's just the, the other thing, it's sort of, we were talking a little bit uh, at a different point about this, you know, well, wh what's it all mean anyway? You know, like you get to that point where whatever your goal was, if you achieve it, you know, especially if it's a financial goal, but even if it's a, a existential goal, um, then you achieve that. Now what? And a lot of people are not prepared for that. You know, and a lot of people are not prepared for um, post success goals. You know, a lot of people are not prepared to wear it loosely, you know, like wear the success loosely, um, to not, not have it be, uh, become too much of an identity, you know, um, where it's sort of the be all and the end all, you know, and, and that's, there is no be all, there is no end all. And if you treat something as be all and end all, it may crush you. So, um, so yeah, you know, it's funny because, you know, I'm a therapist and so, and I've worked over the years, I've worked with diverse communities, including the extremely wealthy or, and or extremely successful. And, you know, some people will make, you know, wry comments about, you know, like, oh, are their diamond shoes on too tight? You know, is their crown hurting their head? And, you know, the fact is, is that, you know, we're all eligible for the same suffering. It takes different manifestations. And definitely there are people whose manifestations that their lives have taken uh, supply them with a much hardier, you know, institutionalized version of, you know, potential um, inability to uh, not have a great deal of suffering in their life just from the very institutional nature of, oppression and, you know, trauma that is foisted upon cultures and people. And, you know, life is suffering, it's caused by craving and clinging, and we all have that. And we all have the ability at whatever the level is or however that works. And it's not like, it may not be all encompassing, but bit by bit, letting go of certain 
aspects of craving and clinging. Now, does that mean that um, I don't participate? No, it means the opposite. It means I really participate. And so that's one of the pitfalls of success is that I participated, I succeeded, and now I'm going to take a long 30-year nap, you know, until I just sort of fade away. Or I'm going to uh, spend my money lavishly on what? Um, so I think some of it has to do to going back to the right livelihood thing. It's sort of, you know, what is the purpose of my success? And for a lot of people, or my experience has been for many people who suffer from it, who don't enjoy the fruits of it, it's because the goal of the success was to be successful or the goal of the success was to be the big person, or the goal of the success was to have some power, or the goal of success was to have lots of money so that I have more money than you. So you end up suffering because that's, it's, it's nowhere. It's a nowhere deal. But if the goal of the success was to be of service somehow, right? You know, some people are of service with physical acts. Some people are of service with finances. Some people are of service with um, entertainment they provide. Some people are of service with, you know, it's not all doctors and nurses and, and uh, EMTs. So, so yeah, that's some of it. And I've, I've really, you know, and I've worked, I've worked in, um, you know, drug and alcohol rehab with people with great means who either don't get it or die or you know, so there's, you know, number one, that it's not a uh, success or financial success is not, does not give one immunity to problems like that. And then also sometimes that does exacerbate it. You know, that loss of meaning or loss of motivation or loss of ability to kind of see the point in not getting hammered all the time. So that's another example of what can go wrong. It depends on the definition of calling, right? It's sort of like because people, you know, is everyone supposed to be president or Mother Teresa or, you know, uh, it makes me think of the past life regression thing. I kind of, I, I, I joked about that earlier, you know, it's sort of like any, anytime I hear a past life regression story, it's always Catherine the Great or, you know, it's never like I was Joe, you know, from Sicily in the 1500s and I had a store, you know. Um, yeah, everyone has a calling. I think everyone has a calling to, the real calling is, and there's other ways that people put this, but the Buddhist way of putting it is, the, the, everyone's calling is to understand the nature of suffering and that there is an answer to suffering, to end suffering, and to achieve, um, and I'll use some of the Buddhist words, it's uh, to achieve liberation and in many Buddhist traditions, in the service of being able to help others to achieve that liberation from suffering. So then everybody has a calling. Um, and it can manifest in any sort of um, type of human or other form and any type of cultural form or, you know, it's all possible. For, for anyone. And again, as I was saying in another part of the interview, it's sort of like some people have um, more opportunity than others to be uh, coming from a place of, I'm going to go after that spiritual liberation, you know, and uh, sort of I have the, the resources that allow me to, you know, take an extra yoga class or whatever it is. And then people who have the opposite of that. So what's each of their calling, I, I, I would think, I would hope, is the same. And it might take different pathways to help each of them get there and not to get diluted. You know, like it's very easy to get diluted on the spiritual path. Um, uh, Chogyam Trungpa had a book, uh, Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism. I don't know if he coined that phrase, but you know, one can really get caught up in the materialistic, I'm, I'm the best meditator kind of materialism. 
And then people who are doing everything they can just to get by, you know, don't might not have that extra that extra time and resources to be uh, go, going towards that. But there are the other ways where they can follow their calling or to achieve that liberation. Um, I feel like everybody has a truth. I guess that that's why what it is is that the calling sort of in my mind makes me think of like a job in a sense or you know like a a, a very particular way of serving people or a particular way of being and I think more that it's uh, um, to well you know from my perspective to do their trauma work so that they're able to have a sustainable life of uh, working in service to themselves and their own liberation and for others. That was really Buddhist answer. <laughs> the way I understand founded depression is that um, it can. It doesn't matter whether it doesn't matter whether we're dealing with success or failure. Where we're sort of it's almost like postpartum, right? You know, a founder of a startup has this uh, birthing um, experience and this experience of, uh, you know, most startup people, uh, founders of businesses uh, go through, and sometimes it's not a phase, but usually all of them will go through a phase of like 12, 14, 16 hour days where it's just nonstop. So there's a, a burnout aspect to it where it's just like, it's just not sustainable. It's not the human body and psyche and spirit wasn't really built to, to go that way. And there's the something that we spoke about earlier about the sort of loneliness, the inherent loneliness. Um, for some people with startups, it's often a very small team or like a team of one. And so there's this sort of me, me or us against the world aspect that you know can feed sort of a feeling of otherness and a feeling of isolation, which are big, you know, sort of um, uh, opportunities to develop depression. And then you know, going through, uh, if it's successful, um, maybe having that extra bit of sort of loneliness at the top syndrome, combined with now everyone around me is suspect, as wanting something from me. So, you know, depression has a lot of different symptoms and, and sometimes those symptoms include anxiety, um, anger, you know, quick to anger. And you know, because uh, uh, Freud got a lot of things wrong, he got some things right. One of the things where, where he talked about anger being um, uh, depression, often being anger turned inward, it's not always the case, but it's one of the things that you can see. So, you know, uh, a founder uh, can be in that place where, you know, um, if they had to be, in order to get the success, if they had to be really aggressive, right? You know, like assertive, maybe it started with assertiveness and it went to aggression, or they're angry at competitors, or they're angry at, you know, because they thought they were gonna make 30 million and they only made 10 million, you know, like whatever it is. And so that's on the success side, and then on the, you know, it's a little easier to spot, you know, when it doesn't work out, you know, just, things don't go well, you know, and so it can be like a situational depression. Like I had it all and now I have none of it. And, and, and I'm still uh, isolated and alone. And, you know, and even if I had a team, the team has scattered because they got to go find a job, you know. So um, and I think it's a, it's a very real thing and I think it's associated to, it's a little bit of this, um, the nature of the economy or the nature of the way people work now. There's a lot more, there's a lot more isolation. There's a lot more at stake. There's a lot more fast money that actually is available, you know, for an individual or for a couple of individuals to kind of stake out. Um, often at a young age, you know, where um, you may not yet have developed enough of the emotional coping skills to deal with anything and everything that comes with things taken off or things tanking. So. Um, that's my understanding of it. Like I talked about earlier, clinical dharma was written 
initially for clinicians and for other healthcare people and just people who are in the helping professions. And then as I started to get my first readers, you know, gave it to people to check it out and see if it was ready. They were like, this is for every, you know, this is for anybody. And so when I think of it too, from the context of some of what we've talked about today of um, leaders and founders and, you know, teams and managers, right? I mean, the, the role of a leader is, is very much that of caregiver. It doesn't look like a therapist or it doesn't, you know, sometimes it takes that t flavor for a minute when it's necessary, but it, it's not like the same as healthcare, but it's still a caregiving relationship. I have to like nurture my business. I need to nurture the people that work with me and for me. And so um, what gets lost in that is I'm out, you know, there's potential for being very outward focused, just like with a clinician who's just like, I must take care of you. I'm never, never thinking of me. Um, same with a leader, you know, it's sort of like maybe, yeah, it's my vision and, and the reason I'm orchestrating this orchestra the way I am is to meet that, those goals that I've laid out, that I've envisioned, but I'm not, self-care is not in that equation necessarily. And especially if I'm doing the 12, 14, 16 hour day, especially if it's like I eat, sleep and breathe that, well, uh, you know, you actually need food to eat and you need to sleep and you need um, some form of balance. So, um, so in using sort of the same clinical Dharma formula, which is essentially, I, I didn't really invent it, you know, it's, the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path. So if, if someone looks at their self-care as a leader through that prism and, you know, sort of looks at, um, with clinicians, I talk about how the craving and the clinging is for like a certain result. Like if you don't get better, I'm going to, I'm going to fall apart. Like, you know, I'm a, I'm a therapist. And if you don't feel better, I mean, this is the, the, what I'm hoping doesn't happen anymore is that, you know, like you don't feel better. So I have failed and now I hate myself. and I'm going to get myself a bunch of lashes with a wet noodle. And then, um, with a leader, right. You know, the business doesn't do well or, you know, and, um, and what am I going to do? Am I going to beat myself up or am I going to, you know, take care of myself so I can re-energize to be able to, you know, sort of, um, be able to build a better business or to work better with my team or to, you know, make things happen. Um, so it's, it's a, it's a bit of an illusion that, you know, if I, if I do 18 hour days and don't sleep or eat or take care of myself, that I'm going to win, um, seems to me to be an illusion. So, so having the wisdom to know that, uh, that's not how we're built setting the intention to uh, take care of myself at the same time, taking care of my work, um, and then being wise in my speech and har harmless, not harmful in my speech, in my actions, in my livelihood. And, you know, I've been meditating a long time, so what am I going to say? You know, the last three factors are effort, mindfulness, and concentration, which essentially means meditate. Um, or find and or find some other way to achieve sort of the non-judgmental present time awareness that comes with mindfulness meditation because then then you can be in this sort of balanced state and the the side effects of this according to buddha and others are um, that we will be filled with loving kindness we'll be filled with compassion for ourselves and others We'll be filled with appreciative joy. We'll have happiness for the happiness of others. And we'll have equanimity, balance, and ease in the face of awesomeness and complete suck. And so to me, that to me that sounds like a leader who's ready to lead. Right? You know, like if I do all that self-care and I get those benefits, then I'm able to lead. <laughs>